you got your Bibles, go to Jonah, starting a whole new series, going through Jonah uh, for six weeks. We'll be in the Old Testament. Um, it's going to be a little chopped up. I, I like to plan ahead. I was actually scrolling through the uh, the preaching calendar just to, so I could share what was coming up next. And I've already got like some things planned out in 2018. So Because most of you know I don't like surprises. And then we got Irma, and that threw everything off. So... <laughs> But we're gonna we're gonna be in Jonah for a couple for for now. Then we're gonna take a little break uh, because next week um, with Operation Christmas Child kicking off, we're gonna get to hear from Andy and Becky Carlson, who are uh, part of Samaritans First. They work with Operation Christmas Child, and they've actually gone and distributed shoe boxes. So the boxes that we pack, that we pray over, that we um, just fill with love and with gifts, they've actually given them to the kids and to the to the families uh, in I believe Rwanda is where they've where they've been. So they're going to share. Uh, then the next week, um, you'll, you'll notice um, October 8th is when we'll start our deacon nomination. So we'll be hearing about from God's Word about deacons. So be praying about who you would nominate uh, for that. We have four deacons that are five deacons that are serving. Most of them are rotating off. So we need to replenish the ranks. And uh, we are looking for men that are qualified and willing to serve in that role. Um, it's a necessary ministry here at the church. Uh, then we're going to take a break again, next generation, uh, because Kim will be here. Kim and Dan have actually been visiting for the last couple of weeks. Don't worry, they've said nice things about you, but they've been coming for the last couple of weeks just checking things out. So they'll be here that Sunday, and so we're going we're gonna to share everything about the next generation. Then we'll get back into Jonah. <laughs> so hang tight. We'll be in Jonah this week, and then we'll, we'll pick it back up. But we want to talk about uh, Jonah, a God for the gladness of the nations. Um, I was a big Seinfeld fan uh, when it was on, still am, and uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with the show, it's a buddy comedy that follows four friends in New York City in the 90s, and one of the characters is a guy named George. George has nothing that goes right for him. George is the foil for most of what happens on the show. He's a poor sap who have, never has anything go right. He loses relationships, jobs, um, prematurely bald, always sad, moves back in with his parents. Um, it's just a, it's kind of a comic relief. Well, there's one episode where George looks at his life and he realizes that nothing has gone right. And so in a moment of clarity, he decides, whatever I thought I wanted to do was wrong. I need to do the complete opposite of what I think I should. And Jerry and Elaine and Kramer just play along with them. They say, of course, that makes perfect sense, George. Whatever you thought you wanted to do, just do the opposite of it. I'm sure it will all work out. And so he orders a different sandwich than he's ever gotten before. And then, because he's had terrible luck with relationships, decides that he's going to approach a beautiful woman at the diner. And he introduces himself by saying, my name's George. I'm unemployed, prematurely bald, and I live with my parents. And her response is, I'm Susan, it's nice to meet you. And so in the episode where he decides he's going to do everything opposite, he gets the date with the dream girl, he gets his job with the New York Yankees, and he moves out of his parents' house, seemingly everything working out because he's made the opposite decision of what he should or normally does. And the kicker is, is that it doesn't work like that. And we're going to look at Jonah as proof of that. We're going to look at Jonah as more than a story about a whale. It's about a God who has an intense love for the nations. He has a deep love for those who have not responded to him yet. Because the book, Let the Nations Be Glad, which draws its title from Psalm 67, talks about that and says missions is not ultimate. Worship is. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. Missions exist because worship doesn't. And when this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. The story of Jonah is less about a whale more about a God who loves those who haven't responded yet. It's a missionary God. He loves the nations. He loves those that he sends us to, near and far. He sent Jonah to Nineveh as a witness to their sin and their need for a Savior, just as he sends us into workplaces, neighborhoods, HOA meetings, clubs, soccer teams, supermarkets as witnesses. And the big idea this morning is that God will not be stopped 
by our disobedience to see the lost saved. So this is an ironies in disobedience. It's a message where we look at, at Jonah's attempts to disobey God and how God works in spite of it in a sense of irony. So let's read Jonah 1, verses 1 through 16. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, O sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jonah. We thank you that you worked in spite of his disobedience, that you are going to accomplish what you set out to do. God, I pray that we would respond with obedience. We would respond in trust and we would respond in faith that you are going to take care of us and that you don't need to, to send us to the middle of the ocean and the belly of a whale for us to realize you're at work. So God, I pray as we look at these ironies that we would see that you are the one that works not us. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's five ironies that I want us to look at as we go through this narrative in Jonah. The first one is kind of the, the biggest one. Jonah thought that he could flee God's presence. Jonah thought he could get away from God. So the call was clear. God spoke to Jonah and said, go to Nineveh and preach against them. Go to Nineveh, preach the gospel. Go tell the Assyrians who are among the most cruel and vicious people that have ever lived, who are the sworn enemies of the nation of Israel, who will, um, through conquest and pillaging, destroy nations around them. Go right to the center of it all and tell them to repent. Historians record the atrocities committed by the Assyrians. One of their kings in his journal describing a conquest described his war chariot as covered, as splattered, with the blood and filth of enemies. It's not a pretty picture, not a pleasant people, not a kind people. And rather than embrace the challenge and charge into God's will to be obedient to where God had called him, Jonah tries to get out of it by seeing if he can get away from God. Jonah thinks that if he can hide from God, he can get away. This is nothing new. Adam and Eve did the exact same thing. When they took the fruit, when they recognized their sin, they tried to hide from God. They tried to get away from his presence. They tried to hide in the garden. And it was a lot like when I, we play hide and seek with our kids. And we count it, and I'll count to ten, usually I make it to eight because they've already gone on. And God bless them, they just don't know, they can't, they don't know value yet. So I'll count to ten, 
and I'll say, all right, I'm coming for you. Where are you? And I'll see their little curly heads sticking up. <laughs> are you over there? No. Or they'll just run out, and I'll ignore them for a second. That's what it's like when we try to hide from God. Is God's not going, I don't know where they are. Gosh, I hope I can find them. God knows exactly where we are. It's, just, it's like a parent playing a game with a toddler. And Jonah thinks that he can out-clever God by going as far away from where God had called him to go. So the, the map is up there. It shows you where Joppa is. shows you where Nineveh is. shows you where Tarshish is. And in Jonah's wisdom, he thinks, well, if I just get on a boat and go to the other side of the known world, then I'll get away from God. I'll be able to escape God's call. Except he can't, because you can't flee God's presence. Tarshish is kind of a vague term for that far western part of the Mediterranean, goes to the other side of the world. And even though Jonah tries traveling incognito, he tries hiding like a celebrity from the paparazzi, God is going to find him. God is going to work, and God is going to use Jonah, even if Jonah's not on board with it to start with. So here's the encouragement from, from the word this morning, is maybe you know, or maybe it's you yourself, or maybe someone you love is running from God, is in rejection of their conscience, is living in rebellion, is refusing God. They're trying to go to their own Tarshish. They're trying to get away from him. The encouragement from the word this morning is that God is not finished with them yet. God is still working even when they think they're trying to get away and go to the other side of the world. The second thing that we see, the second irony, is that Jonah slept while the ship was sinking. So the storm hits. This is something unlike what the sailors had ever seen before. It's a greater storm. It's a greater force than they've ever been aware of. And so they're doing everything they can. They're bailing out the boat. They're dumping cargo. They're, trying, they're praying to all of their gods. Where's Jonah? The entire time this is happening, he's asleep. He's asleep. They're crying out to their gods, pleading for help. They're throwing everything overboard. And within earshot is a prophet who speaks for God, who speaks God's words, who gives what God tells him, who has the authority of heaven and earth to share what the Lord has to say. And while they're throwing their stuff into the ocean, while they're praying to the false gods, the prophet is asleep. How? I, th I think his conscience was seared, that he was calloused. And so there's all of this happening around him, and his response is to ignore it and to go to sleep. One of the ways that it was explained to the kids is like calluses on for a guitar player. And when you start playing an instrument, your fingers blister, they hurt because your skin hasn't been callous to it. But over time, repetitive use, you build the calluses. Get those blisters on your hands when you do yard work until you build the calluses of strong hands so that it doesn't affect you anymore. And Jonah had allowed his heart to be calloused to the things of God. So that when he see when all of this is happening around him, his response is to shrug it off and just go to sleep. Here's the thing. A lot of Christians are waiting for God to show them what they're supposed to do. God's told us what we're to do. God has given us marching orders. Following God isn't something that we do later. It's something now. So a lot of times we see Christians that just wait. And they wait for God to reveal to them. I'll do X when I see Y. And God doesn't work like that. God doesn't, God doesn't call us to do in response to some sign, and we're supposed to just sit there and wait patiently like we're at the DMV waiting for our number to be called. God's active call is for us to serve and to do and to build. And out of that, he calls us to great things. Out of that, when he calls us to serve and to lead. The kingdom is now. The principle is that we see God's call in our lives is something we do now, not later. Not when we are, have enough money or have enough time. It's like when you talk to someone that wants to get married or have kids and they say, 
well, I want to wait to get married until I ha we have enough money. Okay. I want to wait to have kids. We want to wait to have kids until we're financially secure. The tidbit of knowledge is that unless your last name is Gates, you will never have enough money to have children. You will never be secure enough. You will never have the time. You will never have checked off everything that you have to do. And that's why it's one of those things where it's like, if God calls you to it, you can't wait until later. If God calls you, you have to say yes then. Let's not ever let ourselves get to the point where our consciences are so seared or we're so blind to the reality around us that instead of taking action, our response is to ignore it and take a nap. And that's what happened with Jonah. And what's been great is seeing the response all over the state of Florida as we've seen the hurricane damage and the response. Who's been on the ground? Churches. Who's been serving? Christians. Who's been taking chainsaws? Who's been clearing branches? Who's putting up new roofs? Christians. The third irony is that Jonah reveals his identity. So, verse 9, we get that he reveals that he's a Hebrew, that he follows God, that he knows the God of heaven who created the earth. Jonah flees from him, and this is when those in the boat realize that this passenger that they've had on board is more than just some guy. He's a fugitive from God. He's a fugitive from the one true God. He is more than who he has said he is, and Jonah is fleeing from, from God. And the ship, the mariners, know this is something special. This is something more. This is a God who's more powerful than any of the, any of the, the statues they've worshipped. There's something to the God of Israel. They had heard what he had done, and they feared him. Later, we'll see that that fear goes to worship, and we see the, this transformation of the mariners, I believe. But for now, they just recognize the terror of what it means to fall into the hands of God. And Jonah's sitting right there saying, yeah, I'm a prophet. I, I'm a Hebrew. And up to that point, he had been a secret Christian, <clears throat> identifying with God when it's comfortable, when it's convenient, but then hiding when it's not, keeping his identity secret. Keeping the lamp hidden, keeping the salt in his pocket. And that's what far too many who claim the name of Christ are. It's easy. It's convenient. Sign me up. As soon as it gets hard, I'm out. And so they hide the lamp. They hide the salt. They keep it quiet. and Because if that identity were to be revealed, it would be costly. So... Sometimes our identity comes out in the most inopportune times. Um, I, I had a, a student in an online class. Uh, it, you guys will learn, like, it carries the nice one most of the time, um, more than me. And I can't remember, I, get, I, get some I, got, I would get some really dumb emails. One of them, and I, Heidi gave me the okay on this one, was to respond to a student who asked, when's our next assignment due? Instead of being nice and typing out, well, thanks for asking, it's due next Friday, was to take a screenshot of all the assignments directly from the syllabus, attach it in the email, and reply with that. I told you, Carrie's the nice one. Well, this, this, this student, I, it, it was in the middle of all the hurricane prep. And so I'm running around, we're trying to find boards, we're trying to find water, we're scared, to, you know, Carrie's scared to death, we don't know what's going to happen, we're panicking, we're trying to do all this, and I get some email that has some ridiculous question in it, and it's the straw that breaks the camel's back, and I fire off a response that wasn't inappropriate, it was definitely not professional. And then I get the reply from the student, and I realize, because she has her, her, her faith on display in her email signature, Oh man, I haven't just blown it as a teacher. I've blown it as a brother in Christ. The once the identity's out, then it's the gut punch. Then it's where we realize, oh man. So many times, we're like Jonah. We're hiding our identity until it's too late. When God calls us to live as lamps and salt.
the fourth irony in verse 13. So Jonah reveals who he is. Jonah said, I'm a Hebrew. The mariners all panic because now they've realized that they haven't just run into a storm. They've run into the judgment of God. And so now they're extra panicked. And so they say in verse 13, they try to row harder mm -hmm. to get back to land. But they couldn't, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. This is a microcosm of all of us. When things get tough, when we find ourselves facing imminent danger and death, we just row harder. So the sailors are faced with an insurmountable storm, and their response is, maybe we'll just swim harder. Maybe we'll just try harder. Let's row faster and see if we can beat the hurricane, see if we can beat the storm. We do this. We try to put off extra weight by saying no to bacon. We try to put off death by prolonging our life with machines. We try to help our team win by yelling at the TV louder. We try to do all of these things. And for those that don't know God, their attempt to get around their conscience, to get around what they know to be right and wrong, is to simply work harder. They try to be better. They try harder. They try to be good. They try to work harder. And it's futile. Every time we go to the beach as kids, and we do it to our kids too, is we say, watch out for the riptide. And so as a kid, I hear that, and I think it's going to be some cartoonish character coming out of the water. <laughs> but I remember being told, watch out for the riptide. It'll pull you out before you know it. And one time we went to the beach, and my sister and my cousin, we watched them get pulled a little further out without even realizing it until we could finally get their attention and get them out of the riptide and get them back to shore. Because the whole point on the riptide is, is you can fight the riptide. You can swim as hard as you can against it. You can try your best. You can do everything in your power, and you'll fail. Because not even Michael Phelps can do anything with eight feet per second. You'll wear yourself out. You'll drown. It's the futility of works. And so many of us live our lives swimming against the riptide, trying harder, trying to do better, trying to be gooder, and thinking that's going to impress God, thinking that's going to earn us something. That's what those who don't know Christ do every day. It's justification by charity. It's justification by good works. It's justification by volunteer hours. It's justification by everything else except faith, except the gift that's given by God. So you swim parallel to the riptide. You swim not against it. You swim away from it. You respond to it by not fighting against it, but by escaping it. And so much of the Old Testament is a shadow and a glimpse of Christ. So when we read the Old Testament, we have to read the Old Testament in light of the New. And what happens is from the pages of Genesis all the way through to Malachi is we will see glimpses and shadows of Christ. Let's try this one on for size. There's death coming. There is certain death. And a sacrifice is required who will perish, who will die for the sake of others. The sailors will then receive the benefit and the blessing applied from the sacrifice of another. What God is doing in the middle of an ocean with pagan sailors and a runaway prophet is he's giving us a picture of the cross where Christ dies for us in our place and then we receive the benefit, the blessing of his sacrifice. This is a glimpse of the gospel. This is a glimpse of the cross, and it's told in Jonah. And that takes us to the fifth irony, and perhaps the best one. Not because it's the most silly. That's the first one. The first irony is the silliest one of all, that you think you can run away from God. You think you can play hide-and-seek with God. The last one is an incredible reminder that God is still at work. So verse 16, they've thrown Jonah into the ocean. They've prayed to God, Lord, don't hold this against us. Don't take this innocent man's blood on our account. And they throw him in, and the sea's calm, and here's the response of the sailors. 
the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. I read verse 16 that they got saved. Not just saved from the storm. I read verse 16 that these sailors believed in God and trusted him because of what they did to Jonah. And all throughout chapter 1, all we've seen is a disobedient prophet who's trying to run away from God. And the whole time, God's still working. God's still doing things. God said, okay, Jonah, you're going to go to Nineveh, and you're going to preach the gospel to them. You're going to tell them to repent. Jonah thinks it's a good idea to run away. And so God says, no, 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 that's not how this works. You don't get to run away. I'm still going to work, and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Because these pagans that you were put on the boat with, I'm going to save them. I'm going to rescue them. I'm going to bring them out of death into life as a reminder that I can do this. And then when you go to Nineveh, and I'm going to give away chapter 4, when he goes to Nineveh and preaches a half-hearted message, kind of read it like a kid telling the, their brother they're sorry, is how Jonah preaches where he says, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. The city falls flat on its face and repents because God works. And despite Jonah's failures, God is still working. God is going to accomplish something even when we blow it, even when we disobey, even when we mess up. God is going to work because the word works. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word that goes from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty. Maybe your translation says void. But it shall accomplish that which I purpose, <clears throat> and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The word doesn't return void. Even when we don't think something's going on, even when we can't see it, God is still working. Next month, we'll celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation when a lowly monk in Germany nailed 95 questions to a church door so that he could have an academic discussion with the Catholic Church. And it turned the world on its head. And that's the great drama of the Reformation, of the irony of the Reformation, is that Luther didn't set out to flip the known world on its head. Luther just wanted some questions answered. And the response was incredible. As the face of Europe changed, as the gospel was preached, as the word was translated into German, into English, into French, it was translated into the language of people. It was translated so that it could be read. And when it could be read, it could be understood. When it could be understood, it could be shared. So churches get planted all over Europe. Um, Calvin and some others in, in Geneva sent missionaries to Brazil. Then we see them forming and shaping in England, going to Amsterdam, then coming over here and establishing churches and planting communities here in America. And all of this happens because of one man asking some questions who never set out to do any of this, but as a result of the word, saw the world transformed. Towards the end of his life, Luther said this in, in hindsight, in reflection of everything that had happened around him. He said, take me, for example, I opposed indulgences and the papists, but never by force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And then while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my Philip of Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that never a prince or emperor did such damage to it. I did nothing. The word did it all. Had I wanted to start trouble, I could have started such a little game at Verms that even the emperor wouldn't have been safe. <clears throat> but what would it have been? A mugs game. I did nothing. I left it to the word. The word works. When God speaks, it doesn't return void. It accomplishes something. It works. And Jonah, even though he has been disobedient, even though he is running from God or trying to, God is still working because the word works. The word will do what it set out to do. The word will not be stopped 
even by our disobedience. As a youth pastor, I watched Mr. Cool Tough Guy High School dude fall flat on his face and crumble like a house of cards from the word. We were on a retreat, we were in a hotel room, he was not a believer yet, he had a lot of questions, and I said, let's just go to the Word. Let's just read the Bible. And I can't remember, I think it was Romans 8 or something like that, because I wanted to get to the last part where it talks about the security we have in Christ, and I just start reading, and like three verses in, this guy's flat on his face, bawling, and he's confessing his sin, and he's trusting Christ. And, I'm like, and I told him, I was like, we're not even to the good part yet. <laughs> The word works. Y'all remember from the video a couple weeks ago before the storm when we, we baptized Deegan. And I'm going to tell this story over and over again because it's a reminder that the word works, not us. So Deegan goes to his mom and dad and he says, I need to, I need to get baptized. I need to become a Christian. And so they just ask, okay, well, what happened? Tell us about that because this is, this is kind of a big deal. He said... Well, it was after the children's message on keeping your promises. Okay, so what's the connection? I need to keep my promise to God. All, all right. Y'all know that that was an adultery lesson? <laughs> Kid got saved during a lesson on adultery. And it's not because we're clever or we're cute or because we package things. It's because the word works. The word doesn't return void. The word works. And God still works in spite of what we see. Sometimes against us, sometimes with us. That's why the best thing I can always say is sometimes all you need to do is get out of God's way. I always heard the story of a, of a uh, camp speaker that one week they had a camp speaker that was polished and refined and had all these clever tactics and very creative. And then the next week they had some guy that bumbled through his every message that could never get a clear thought out. And what was so amazing was the staff with the second guy were like, okay, nothing's gonna happen. No one understands what this, what this guy's talking about. All of a sudden the floor gets rushed because God worked through his word. It had nothing to do with the mouthpiece. God's word works. And that's what we have confidence in, is that God isn't dependent on us. I'm really thankful for that, especially because these things are being recorded, that the word works in spite of us sometimes. So here's your application points. Three things, trust, obey, and treasure. Trust God. Whenever God is working, all we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg. God may be doing 10,000 things in your life, and you're aware of three of them. It's one of my favorite Piper quotes. God's doing 10,000 things in your life. You're aware of three of them. We trust him, even when it doesn't seem like it's working out, even when it doesn't feel like it is. We trust him because the word will not return void, and God keeps his promises so we can trust him. He's promised to finish the work. He's promised to do what he's going to do, and we can trust him. But with that trust comes obedience. Whatever God commands us, whatever God calls us, whatever that stirring in your heart is, whatever he's prompting, whatever he's leading you to do, whatever he's called you is for your good. It's in your best interest. So when God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh, 600,000 people, evil nation, wicked people, they torture and kill their enemies, one prophet shows up, who wins? God! Because it's 600,000 against one, but the one has God. And God is going to win. So when God calls Jonah and tells him, you're going to Nineveh, you're not going alone. And Jonah runs thinking that he's got to do this by himself. And God says, no, 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 that's not how this works. If I call you and you say yes, I'm going with you. And if you say no, I'm going to go get you till you say yes. <laughs> and God does that with us. Whatever God calls us, whatever God commands for us is for our best because he will be with us. So the third thing is for us to treasure him. For us to treasure him. 
Because what we treasure is what will drive us. What we treasure is what will motivate, will drive us. And if we treasure Christ, then trusting him and obeying him are that much easier because of our love for him. If we treasure him, then when he says, follow me, then we know that he has our best. We know that we have his love. We know that we have his presence. And so we will say yes. Treasuring him is the same thing that we see every time we take the kids to the pool and we tell them to jump. Only one of our kids can swim. But if we tell them to jump, they'll leap into the pool. They will take off, running start, dive in. Why? Because they know that they trust us and that if we say jump, we're not going to step back. We watched Charlie Brown last night for family movie night. And Charlie Brown can never kick the football. And every time he tries to kick the football, he pulls it away. God never pulls the football away. God says, come, follow me. He never pulls a bait and switch. He never tricks us. He stays with us. And that's why we can treasure him. That's why Jonah should be able to treasure God. Because even though God told Jonah to go into the heart of evil and preach, God wasn't going to leave him. God wasn't going to abandon him. And it takes until Jonah's in the belly of a whale that he gets it. Sort of. Because even the book of Jonah ends with Jonah still not fully grasping it, the love that God has for the nations. So as we sing, we're going to sing, wherever he leads, I'll go. And let's sing this as a prayer. And if you can sing that, honestly, if you can sing that and say, wherever he leads, I'll go, I'll follow my Christ who loves me so, then sing it loud and sing it joyfully, that wherever he takes you, wherever he leads, your answer is yes. And if you can't, soak in the words. Soak it in and say, Lord, help me to say yes to wherever you lead. Give me the faith to trust you that when you say go, I'll say yes. And whatever kind of response you need to make, this is your time for that. If it's public, then come on down. I'll be glad to talk with you and pray with you. If it's uh, joining the church, your desire to be baptized, um, your, some sort of commitment that you need the church to know about, this is your time. But maybe you just need to do something privately. And you need to say, Lord, I need to trust you, I need to obey you, and I need to treasure you more. And you can do that right where you are. But wherever he leads, let's say yes, and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning that shows us that you're not finished yet and that you don't depend on us. And we are so grateful for that. We're so grateful that your work extends beyond our limitations, that even when we fail, you still do great things. So as we read from Jonah, I pray that our response would be unlike his. I pray that our response would be a joyful yes to whatever it is you're calling us to. Because wherever you call us, you go with us. Wherever you go with us, you protect us. Wherever you protect us, you empower us. So I pray that you would find us faithful this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.